Hi, I'm Toby Philpott. Um, when they first asked me to talk about science and puppetry, I, I hesitated because to me puppetry is an art form. But then on, you know, when I thought about it a bit more, I guess it's really a craft. And craft, because it involves materials and tools and techniques and so on, is the crossover with, with science. Um, just to give you an example of uh, what it was like when I was growing up, the craft side of it. My, my father was a solo puppeteer. Now, he built his own stage, a uh, lightweight uh, wooden stage that broke into two halves, and they folded down into two kind of carryable, nice balanced carry, carryable little uh, frames in, in, inside which you could have the puppets and the scenery and the props and everything else. Um, so he built the stage and uh, made all the puppets, sewed all the costumes, uh, wrote all the scripts, and in performance did all the voices and all the characters. So it's, it's like a shamanistic thing, you know, where one man disappears into a booth and then all these strange characters uh, come and go. It's very magical. Um, but he was very much into the materials for making puppets, for making stages and so on like that. And because I grew up backstage of puppets, I also saw all the different variations of them, marionettes, rod puppets, and so on. And uh, a lot of his friends were sculptors um, and artists of different kinds. But um, that, that solo puppet show thing is a very ancient tradition. I mean, it, you know, it's literally one of the aspects of storytelling around the campfire, in effect. And there is something magic about it. And children make dolls talk to each other. If, if you're doing puppetry, um, children particularly, but most people talk to the puppet, not the puppeteer. It's just something that happens. It, it, there's a magic to it. Um, I, yeah, I grew up with uh, dynamic puppets, you know, the ones that have muscle and bone inside them. But of course, they're also marionettes, string puppets. And the science that's involved there is the science of the pendulum, of course. Uh, the longer the string, the uh, slower the, the swing. So um, you're, you're sort of remote controlling marionettes. It makes them a little bit more uh, dreamy and a little bit less dynamic than the, the hand puppet. And, of course, you, it's the skill there is, is uh, um, adjusting for the length of the pendulum because... Um, if you if you turn the control, you've got to then turn it back to make the creature stop uh, at where you want it to. And so it's quite a tricky skill. Uh, not one of mine. Not one of mine. But then there's the physiology, of course, of hand puppets. Is that you're quite often working with your hand above your head, and the blood uh, comes out of your arm and uh, begins to go numb and it hurts and so on. And you can imagine my dad was doing two of these and one would go off stage and then he'd be down here changing this while this one's still talking and so on. So when I was working with Jim Henson, I did ask him um, whether you ever really got used to this uh, the pain and he went, no, you don't get used, well, you get used to the pain, but you, you don't evolve so that it doesn't hurt anymore. Um, you, you just know it's worth it, I suppose. Um, yeah, so... And then, uh, and yeah, working with Jim Henson, he originally started on television, of course, but when I was working with him, it was on film. Now, uh, we call it a film studio because there's always this pretension to the arts, but actually it's a film factory. It's a technology base. Um, and often using state-of-the-art equipment and so on because there's a big budget in films and the lighting and, and uh, the materials for sets and so on like that but also camera and sound and so on. And these things were, were invented, were, they were invented by practical people, by inventors, not, not scientists as such, not, not theoretical scientists. Uh, mostly as, as a sort of challenge, you know, learning to, whoever had the first uh, amazing idea that you could record sound and play it back later or record visuals and play it back later. They um, they set themselves that challenge at the end of the 19th century, and um, lots of different people tried different techniques. The basic aspect um, of film 
is based on the physiology of the human being that uh, that persistence of vision means that that if you like with a flicker book that if you flicker image still images quickly enough then the brain starts to perceive movement um, when the cameras were hand cranked and they're taking pictures uh, you know it wasn't an exact um, speed they between 20 and 26 frames a second or something like that and they would under crank and make Charlie Chaplin run about faster and so on but he, he, um, essentially that flicker book aspect also led to the possibility of doing um, forms of puppets like the like the um, uh, Ray Harryhausen's uh, animation because if it's 24 frames a second, well, which is what it became as standard. Um, 24 photos uh, and the creature moving one by one, or even painted animation, which is where, you know, crossover with puppets. Um, and in the modern world, Wallace and Gromit and, and those kind of things are all done by uh, fooling the brain with the science of, of, of Flickr. Now, the original film people um it was it was yes it was an entertainment but it they hadn't got around to the thought of documentaries and so on but it was the people who really took it up to start with were magicians stage magicians they had the budget and um, they had an audience for it and they um they took it out as a novelty you know they would put it into their show uh, Plus, they could incorporate magic tricks. I mean, the magician could take a rose and throw it to the girl on the screen, who would disappear from his hand and appear in the screen and so on, or walk around the back of the screen and come through a door in the film and then back out onto the stage and so on. So the, uh, the illusory aspects of film were there. Plus, of course, the possibility of cutting and editing, uh, which you can't do with theatre in real life uh, in quite the same way. So capturing dreams was definitely a feasible option with, with film. Uh, the documentary aspect came later, although they scared people with a train coming into a station and you know, things like that. But um, essentially, the flicker rate was the important aspect of it. And I think it only got standardised when they brought in sound because we're much more aware of of, uh, of changes in pitch if things go faster slower slower so they standardized it at 24 frames a second but i think when it was visual they they just over and under cranked uh, i think buster keaton used to have a banjo player on the set to to keep the rhythm so that the guy cranking would get a steady pace and yeah there's lots of interesting things in the background there and now i've got mad dogs running around me um yeah so, um, and some of those early experiments carried on. I mean, in the 60s, I saw a group called the Black Theatre of Prague who did all kinds of UV uh, effects and so on. Um, black theatre as in um, you, all the performers are in black and the screen is black at the back and then the puppets would be UV, and, and which was, again, a new technology. Um, it didn't exist in the well, 50s. I'm not sure when UV arrived, but... It seemed new to me in the 60s. And um, that that Prague theatre group also had a, a sequence about the history of film and they had three screens on the, on the set, like a silent movie and a thing in a thing. And then the characters started leaking from one to the other. They'd go out a door in one screen and come in the other. The films were all synchronised and so on. So the um, I'm getting away from puppets a little bit. Although, as I say, the fluorescent puppets were were a thing, and we did something similar in in um, labyrinths when we, there wasn't really the green screen or, or blue screen technology. So the wild things, the fiery characters that we did, uh, I was doing the lead singer um, along with two other people. Um, they filmed the scenery and then they covered it in black velvet and covered us in black velvet. And then we did the puppet, and then they, they put the two bits of film together. So Jim Henson was always experimenting with possibilities. Uh, as I say, science and technology and craft is the area where this stuff crosses over. But, um, yeah, I, my dad wasn't uh, that keen on the, on the 
TV puppets uh, of the 50s and so on, he didn't think it was generating the kind of value that puppets can, can offer. They were all a bit simplistic, mostly string puppets, occasional glove puppets, but they weren't treated with much respect. And um, he was really delighted when the Muppets turned up because he went, you see, you see what the possibilities are? Um, now, Jim Henson had taken the TV um, possibilities of filming quickly like that. And the puppeteers would have monitors so that they could actually see their own performance from the outside. They could see what was going into the camera. They could see exactly what was going on screen. So they could work out whether to stay in frame and so on. And um, so Jim used the technology quite a lot. Uh, less so, actually, on, uh, on the Dark Crystal when we made it because um, some of the creatures were so designed that we couldn't see out. Nowadays, you could have a pinhole camera and, and some little goggles. But uh, when I was working inside the Mystics and in the Garthin, um, we worked blind. You know, we, we wore the creature and took the head off, performed all the moves, rehearsed it and so on, and then put the head on and worked blind. So there was actually less opportunity when filming Dark Crystal than working on television. Um, just the restrictions of um, the bigger set and the, and the that aspect. If it was possible, um, we would have monitors so we could see what we were doing. And uh, I worked inside Jim's uh, uh, team, so on Ritual Master and on Jen, we occasionally had a monitor that we could see or we'd have a monitor hanging off our chest that we could see and so on, just because just it would help a little bit. But... Um, it was a challenge. Uh, the um, talking of television, uh, the early experiments with television, with tiny screens, you know, uh, and flickering and all that. They were done. Um, they were trying to make continuous live transmission possible, as opposed to filming and then having to process the film and all that. And uh, there were lots of experiments, but John Logie Baird was doing it in the UK, and he. Um, he tried all kinds of things. I mean, there are, there are records of him do, going into a, a live theatre and having a board with light bulbs on it, which each of which would be effectively a pixel, as, as we would think of it, and the lights would come on and off and, and uh, draw pictures for a theatre audience, uh, moving pictures, live moving pictures. He experimented, experimented, and it's, this is, again, to do with the flicker rate. But... Um, by the late 20s and the early 30s, he had got down to, I think it's a, I don't know the technology exactly, but I think it had a disc with a hole in it that spun at a certain speed so the light would, would flash, flash, flash. And he could capture images and transmit them. Now, my dad, the solo puppeteer, as it happens, he, uh, he took part in these experiments. The, in 1932, he was... Uh, he contacted the BBC and they, John Logie Baird was in, in the basement of the BBC doing experiments in transmission. And uh, Panto Puck, the puppet man, my dad, uh, actually transmitted shows in, in, uh, in 32. Now, they had to have really strong light, so fierce light, you know, hot. And the image was very, very grainy. So... Panto had to repaint his puppets from flesh tones and things to bold black and white. I mean, the very earliest TV experiments, they use a ventriloquist dummy's head, I think. You know, masks are a classic way of, of showing from a distance. The dogs are chewing flower pots. I'm sorry about the crunching, if you can hear that. Anyway, uh, masks. Now, masks are uh, an old technology too, not not just uh, for um, increasing the visibility. Uh, the old Greek masks used to have megaphones inside so that they would increase the sound of, of the voice of the actor as well. But um, anyway, Panto, Panto did this. He transmitted a show. I think he did some in the autumn and then he did some at Christmas as well. He didn't like performing in TV. Could you calm down, guys, please? Sorry about the dogs. Um, 
No, he missed the live audience because his thing was improvising and the, the, the puppets would, would... Because it's a live transmission, um, they're just fighting over flower pots, I'm sorry. Because it was a live transmission, he... Um, uh, he, they didn't have a studio audience, you see. So the interaction wasn't there. And um, I looked up the, uh, the radio uh, listings, and apparently the TV in 1932 went out over two radio channels. One did the visuals, one did the sound, and your receiver, if you were one of the rare people who had a receiver, combined those two to make a little flickering image and the sound. Um, very bizarre thing. By 1936, they'd moved on from mechanical television with this, you know, disc with a hole in it and stuff. And they'd gone on into electronic versions, which is, you know, what we, what we now use. 1936, I think, was the, the official start of TV in the UK. But, uh, as I say, my dad was involved right in those early days. And... Um, I think I said the, the the flicker thing does mean that you can do animation, uh, animate objects. I mean, uh, or, or bendy arm creatures or whatever. But the first TV puppets I saw, I think, were shadow puppets, which is again a very ancient form from Bali and places like that. We have a big light behind, and the shadows of the cutout characters on the screen. <laughs> See, the dogs are bored because I'm talking to myself. Well, they think I'm talking to myself. Uh, so they're messing about with flower pots, <laughs> trying to make interest me. Um, yeah. Anyway, so um, I suppose I should edit all that out. <laughs> Oh dear, dear. Film and puppets and science. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. It, see, it, the definition of a puppet is very, very difficult because I, I, I was part of the British Actors uh, Equity Committee that tried to define a puppeteer once in order for us to get paid properly because, uh, you know, it, it was starting to happen that films were involved in puppeteers. To give you an idea about the difficulty. There was a bank advert once with a singing pig in the front, which is definitely a puppet singing the song. And in the background, there were some dancers in pig heads dancing. The puppeteer was getting paid less than the dancers. And um, he's wearing a mask on his hand and they're wearing a mask on their face. You see the difficulty? Uh, is a puppet... When we tried to define a puppet, it was like... Um, an animated creature. Well, no, it could be an object. It could be a singing cornflakes box, couldn't it? It could be anything like that. Um, the dancing uh, handkerchief. It, it, um, because you can use invisible thread, or you can use rods, or you can use stop frame animation, it, exactly where a puppet starts and masks end, or, or, or that, is very difficult. And of course, People are now inventing motion capture and things where you can, um, where the live actor can perform, but the computer itself can then transform that into an animated creature. So that's not really being a puppeteer because the mime is performing himself, and yet it, it, the final creature looks like an animated puppet. So it's a very strange area. The last job I did in films before I went back to circus was on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And um, although the special effects department had devised solutions for most of the things needed, um, it seemed likely that there would be moments on the set when we would need to devise quickly, spontaneously, uh, ways of, of dealing with this. It's effectively shooting the invisible man, you see. The, the creatures are not there. They're gonna be hand-painted on 24 frames a second. They're going to be hand-painted on the screen in the classic Disney manner. But the cartoon characters interact with uh, real-life objects. So if a, if a cartoon weasel is carrying a machine gun, Dave Barkley or me or someone would be up in the roof with a couple of invisible threads moving the thing. Now, are we 
puppeteering the prop or the character. You can see the grey area. Anyway, yes. So um, I did find myself in the 80s working in the state-of-the-art stuff, um, which did involve uh, technology. Um, I've never been a builder, you see, of puppets. I mean, I've made one or two, but that's not my speciality. And so the materials aspect is not something that I've really dabbled in. But, um, you know, I worked inside Jabba the Hutt for Return of the Jedi, and John Coppinger and uh, Stuart Freeborn's team had to actually invent ways to make uh, what is effectively a puppet but a gigantic one that's got room for three people inside and uh, it's got a hard fiberglass shell that's got airbags on the outside then it's got a huge latex skin and there just wasn't a latex um, application um, suitable to make something that big they ended up uh, with a with their own special uh, latex formula and heating a room to be an oven to to make it uh, go off but you know that's Stuff that's John Coppinger's area of expertise, well, and and the rest of the group. But um, I just inherited the job of, of uh, manifesting Jabba, of uh, bringing him to life, you know, by getting inside and moving him about. <laughs> Relatively easy part of the job, I got to say. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yes, science, science puppets and films. It was very interesting to be doing. Um, to be improvising puppet effects on Roger Rabbit and to be involved in possibly the last hand-painted animation of, of that kind of level of quality. Um, and it got computer-enhanced by ILM as well, um, Industrial Light and Magic, um, adding shadows and all sorts of things to make it really three-dimensional. But, um, yeah, that was my... That was, then science took over and CGI came in and they don't need me anymore. So I went back to circus. And um, that's about it for the moment. About 23 minutes of this. <laughs> I've got to edit, edit the dog crunching up. Now they've gone quiet, of course. Now, now, now that I'm coming to an end, um, why they were fiddling with flower pots, I've got no idea. Look at them now, they're just eating grass. You got bored with trying to get me to do things. Oops. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Enough. Uh, that's my rough draft, and I will improve it.